walls and back We know You didn't do that alone The latest game-changing weight loss drug It's the drug that's taking Hollywood and America by storm but what happens when you stop taking it? Has it been a positive experience for you? Yes and no. What's the no? I you... can't put on weight now. And so that... I don't know what it's done to my metabolism, but I just can't seem to put any on because I think I went too far. This is the cure-all. This is the thing. It's going to make you lose weight. It's going to make you fit in. Everybody's doing it. It's safe. It's fun. But then I was going to literally unsubscribe from life. Hello and welcome back to the channel. I hope that everybody is doing well today. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany. I'm a nurse practitioner and I'm also the creator of the Brittany Holzbeck NP Review. It is the most comprehensive and affordable nurse practitioner boards review on the market and it is accredited through the AANP. And so if you take the course, you are eligible to collect 15 continuing education credits. There's also tons more on the website. There's clinical pearls for the new NP. There's a pharmacology crash course. Everything is available at the new NP p.com and i'll have everything linked in the description box below so i would love for you to come and check it out but otherwise for today's video we are going to be talking all about semaglutide also known as ozempic and i think we've all heard of Ozempic. It's in mainstream media all over the place and I think it's a very relevant topic to discuss. And so let's just get right into today's content. But real quick before we do, if you could just do me a huge favor, go ahead and like this video and subscribe to the channel. It's a free way to help me out and I really do appreciate it. All right, so semaglutide is a medication that belongs to the drug class known as glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist or GLP-1 for short. And it's used in the treatment of type 2 diabetes and in some cases, obesity. So GLP-1 agonists work in multiple ways to positively affect a person's glucose. They, one, increase insulin secretion, which we know insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas, which allows glucose to enter into the cell, leaving the bloodstream and thereby lowering a person's blood sugar. And two, they decrease the production of glucagon, which is a hormone that raises the blood glucose by signaling the liver to break down stored glycogen into glucose glucose and releasing it into the bloodstream. Three, they slow down gastric emptying, which helps to prolong satiety. And finally, four, they signal areas in the brain to decrease appetite and therefore reduce food intake. And so through these various mechanisms of action, not only is this agent successful at improving glycemic control and contributing to weight loss, but in relation to these beneficial outcomes, it's also shown to reduce the risk for cardiovascular events. So considering all of this, it's kind of easy to see why this drug is often revered as a miracle drug. You look great. You look thin. What are you doing? Are you on Ozempic? I started to feel seen for the first time, even after being on television, writing a New York Times bestselling book for the first time. I was being valued by my castmates, by the public in a way that I had never been valued before. And that felt to me sad. So let's talk about semaglutide a little bit more in depth, first as a treatment for type 2 diabetes, and this is sold under the popular name Ozempic. So this agent is used as an adjunct to metformin if needed, or it can be used as monotherapy for those who have either failed treatment with metformin or if they are unable to take metformin. It might actually also be preferred in patients who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or for those who are at risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Other patients that might benefit from this would be those that would benefit from, again, weight loss. Also those that have a significantly higher A1C, such as nine to 10% A1Cs. But with that, it's imperative that we confirm the patient does in fact have type two diabetes and not type one, because this medication is not used in type one diabetes. So semaglutide is available as an oral medication and as a subcutaneous injection. If taking orally, the patient needs to be instructed to take the medication at least 30 minutes before their first food, beverage, or other medication, and the dosing schedule is recommended as follows. Three milligrams once daily for 30 days, and then you increase it to seven milligrams once daily, and then if needed, it can be increased again up to 14 milligrams once daily after they completed 30 days on those seven milligrams. And this increase can be done if it's 
needed to achieve those glycemic goals. Also, it's important to inform the patient that if they miss a dose, they should skip that dose altogether and then resume their normal medication schedule the following day. And then the dosing schedule for the subcutaneous injectable is as follows. So initially it starts with 0.25 milligrams once weekly, and that's for four weeks, and then you increase it to 0.5 milligrams once weekly. You can increase it again to one milligram once weekly after four weeks on that 0.5 if needed, and then you can even increase it further to two milligrams once weekly after they do four weeks on that one milligram a week if again it's needed to achieve those glycemic goals however the maximum that they should be receiving is two milligrams a week again it's important to inform the patient on what to do if they miss a dose so with the injectable semaglutide the missed dose should be administered as soon as possible within five days if it's been greater than five days that's a lapse since their last dose then they need to skip that dose and resume administration at the next scheduled weekly dose. A couple of important considerations. One, the low doses of the oral 3 milligrams or the injectable 0.25 milligrams are not considered therapeutic doses. These are only recommended as a very low starting dose to hopefully prevent unwanted side effects. Two, it's specifically important to maintain a slow titration with patients who have known diabetic retinopathy. And this is so we can avoid causing an exacerbation of this condition. Three, combined Combining this agent with a DPP-4 should be avoided, and this is because both medications work through similar mechanisms, and so there's no additional benefit of combining these meds, and it could potentially increase the risk of negative side effects. And then finally, four, because this medication does delay gastric emptying, this also means that the absorption of other medications can be affected as well. And so close monitoring of other meds might be warranted. So what are the key side effects? So nausea is a component of the medications followed by vomiting, potentially constipation. Some people can say that they feel fatigued or tired. To try and combat these, this is why we titrate semaglutide so slowly. And then there are also a few contraindications aside, of course, from hypersensitivity to the medication that we need to be aware of when we are prescribing semaglutide. So semaglutide is contraindicated in patients with a personal or family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma, and it's also contraindicated in patients with multiple endocrine neoplasia plagia syndrome type 2, which is a rare inherited disorder that causes tumors in the endocrine glands. It is, again, contraindicated in both of these populations. So in regards to the risk of thyroid tumors, this is because the medication was found to cause thyroid C-cell tumors in rodents, depending on both dose and time of exposure, and it's unknown if it would have the same effect on humans but because of these findings, it is contraindicated. Another point worth mentioning is the discussion surrounding worsening mental health associated with the use of GLP-1, like semaglutide. So according to UpToDate, a preliminary evaluation has not found evidence to prove that there is actually a link between the two. However, I am seeing this topic pop up frequently anecdotally, of course, all over social media. And so if nothing else, I think it's really wise to monitor for any worsening mental health, depression, and so on with any of our patients who are taking semaglutide. And of course, to educate them that if they experience any of these symptoms, to be evaluated by a healthcare professional as soon as possible. It is important to recognize that looks and identity can be interwoven. And if you change your look so much that you feel like a different person, then your identity is changing. Unfortunately, when we're dealing with obesity, often there is an overlay of, of mental health disorder or maybe some issues with disordered eating may emerge. There also may be issues with body dysmorphia. I am very adamant to not prescribe these medications in people that are solely using these for aesthetic purposes. There's been a more than 930% increase in patients getting prescription semaglutide in the past four years. I really think that we need to be thoughtful and mindful about this. We have 
a shortage of these medications for people that do need them. I also found it interesting that semaglutide is contraindicated in pregnancy and breastfeeding in Canada, but not in US labeling. Although as a general rule, GLP-1s are not recommended for patients with type 2 diabetes planning to become pregnant. Patients who could become pregnant should use effective contraception during therapy and specifically, semaglutide should be discontinued for two months or longer prior to becoming pregnant. And then let's just talk a little bit about semaglutide as it's used for weight management specifically. In this situation, semaglutide is sold under the trade name Wiovi. It's intended to use as an adjunct to both healthy eating or dieting and then exercise. It is specifically indicated for patients with a BMI of 30 or greater or in those with a BMI of 27 or greater plus a weight-associated comorbidity such as hypertension or dyslipidemia. It can also be used in pediatric patients 12 and older that have a BMI in the 95th percentile or higher. Now this is given subcutaneously and the dosing schedule is as follows. Week 1 through week 4 is 0.25 milligrams once a week. Week 5 through week 8, 0.5 milligrams once a week. Week 9 through week 12, 1 milligram once a week. And then week 13 through week 16, 1.7 milligrams once weekly. And then week 17 and thereafter, after the maintenance dosing is reached, 2.4 milligrams once weekly is the preferred regimen. However, if it's not tolerated, an alternative maintenance dose of that 1.7 milligrams once a week can be used. The manufacturer recommends stopping semaglutide if that dose of 1.7 milligrams a week cannot be tolerated. However, it has been said that some patients can achieve weight loss on those lower doses, even lower than the 1.7 milligrams. And so it's just something to keep in mind if you're patient is benefiting at those lower doses and isn't able to tolerate the higher doses. And then as far as a missed dose and how the patient needs to handle this, it should be administered as soon as possible, again, within five days. So same again, when we do the subcutaneous for the diabetes, it's got to be given within five days and then you would resume the normal weekly schedule. However, if the missed dose was more than five days, then you would just skip that dose and pick back up on the next scheduled dose. All right, but I think that is going to end our brief discussion today on semaglutide. Definitely a lot to go over there in just a short amount of time. Hopefully you learned a little something. Let me know if you are a practicing nurse practitioner, if you are prescribing this in your practice, and any tidbits of info that you have to add to today's discussion. But otherwise, I think that's going to be it. As always, I wish you guys nothing but the best. Don't forget to learn something new every day, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye guys!